Hi, folks. My name is Aiden Crenshaw. I'm running kind of double duty running between video and actually giving a talk this time around. So let's see how well this works. My talk today is on Bluetooth padlocks. First, a little bit about me. I run IronGeek.com. I think I've spoken here every year since 2010. Um, I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know everything. I'm just a geek with time on my hands. If I get something wrong, please let me know. And I'm also a senior information security consultant at TrustedSec and a co-founder of DerbyCon. I'd like to invite all of you all to buy some tickets, but we already sold out. So look around on Twitter, and hopefully you can find some. Usually there's always somebody who last minute finds out from work that, oh, you can't actually make it, and they end up selling the ticket on Twitter. So just keep an eye out there. A few thanks to some of my lock mentors. First of all, Doss, man, he's the one that taught me most things I know about as far as, um, well, this is my introduction to locks, lock picking, and uh, lock bypass. And he's one of the guys in Bloomington Fools in Bloomington, Indiana. Then uh, Debian Olaf, who I think was here two or three years ago, who's an expert lock picker, has a great book out there on, uh, I think it's called Practical Lock Picking, and then he has a second book, which I titled, which escapes me, on more advanced subjects. And uh, Shane Lawson's another good lock picker. He's a technical editor on some of Debian's books. Uh, Doug Highwell and Jeff Moss out of the Cleveland area. They run Cleveland Lock Sport, a couple of good guys. And Skylar Town, who is kind of a lock historian. And um, actually, one of his ancestors, I believe, was uh, one of the inventors of the uh, uh, early developers, at least, of the pin tumbler lock. Uh, he talks about locks like uh, some men might talk about their wives, assuming that he likes his wife. He's a uh, He's a very good guy. He has some interesting talks. So we're going to be talking about Bluetooth locks. And so the core idea of Bluetooth lock is instead of using a traditional key to open it, you're using your smartphone. Or in some cases, a little RFID that might come along with it. All these locks open up via Bluetooth. Some also use a little uh, near-field communications chip in a, a dongle or something or a card to be able to open them up. The advantages, of course, are no need for a key or a combo. You can assign and revoke access to others pretty easily. A lot of these phone applications actually have some set up to where you can just say, okay, send this email to this person. Assuming they have the app, I now grant them permission to actually open this lock for me. You can also track who's opening and closing it, and you can get some geo-tracking on where it was open and closed. On some of the luggage locks that are coming out, that's going to be kind of interesting. Although, keep in mind, this uses your phone services, so you're going to see a whole lot of times probably where it says that... Um, Geographically, your lock was open somewhere out there right off the coast of Africa at 00, zero Latin long. Disadvantages, um, added attack surface, sort of. I mean, you're adding Bluetooth and RFID to it, so that's extra places you can attack. However, you're also removing the keyway, which lowers the attack surface. Also, power is needed, and we'll have to show you the various ways these things get charged up. Now, the locks I'm going to be talking about, these are the ones I've collected so far. People ask me, well, you're doing stuff on Bluetooth padlocks. What about Bluetooth door locks? Padlocks are a lot cheaper. I mean, the cheapest Bluetooth door lock I think I've seen is like 120 bucks, maybe. I think most of them $200 range. But I can get me a Bluetooth padlock for like 60 bucks. So I've been playing around with them instead. And truthfully, most of the work I've been doing so far has been um, on the physical side of them, not even hitting the Bluetooth stack. Uh, the Bluetooth stack hacking that so far has been proven to be more difficult than I would like, but there's still ways in some of these locks using old-fashioned uh, locksmith tricks. But this is the quick lock. It's one of the earlier ones to market. Every Bluetooth lock I see out there it keeps claiming, oh, we're the first Bluetooth smart lock. Well, no, not really. Maybe you should do a little more searching. A whole bunch of people came up with the idea about the same time. This one you can open up via Bluetooth or NFC. Uh, it has an auto unlock mode where if you have the app open, I believe it is, and you get close enough, it will automatically unlock. More on that later on. There's locker mode and non-locker mode in the master lock um, paddock I'll be talking about a little bit later on. But they work in similar principles. This uses spring-loaded locking dogs, and that is its biggest flaw. And uh, let me uh, see if I can whip this lock out and show it to you real quick. This is the quick lock. My lighting's a little low up here, so you really can't see everything too well. I activate it, but it's pressing that, and then I can use my phone application. If it runs out of power, I can recharge it via USB. I just have to pull off that little rubber stopper. And as I said before, it uses spring-loaded locking dogs. 
and I'll explain what that is very shortly. And I forgot my phone. I didn't. Uh, let me go get it so I can actually unlock these. Okay, so we're going to open up the quick locker app. It's hopefully going to try to pair up. Now, it's not on all the time, so what you have to do is press the button and make sure Bluetooth is started up. Hopefully, it finds it. And it's going to on auto unlock mode. So I press it, it sees the phone. Hopefully. And I can unlock it. I'm going to turn off uh, auto unlocker mode. And in that case, when I press it, I actually have to do another step on the phone itself to unlock it. But that's most of the quick lock in a nutshell. The, the initial password for syncing up the quick lock, as I showed you, was 1234567 Hopefully, most people will change that. Uh, but my locks. Well, you see, I already left the password the same. And there's not a whole lot of necessary features on this one, but um, this is the first one I was able to get a hold of. The next one I got a hold of was the Noak. The Noak's pretty cool. You can track when and where it's unlocked and locked. Though keep in mind, this relies on your phone's uh, geo your phone's um, geolocation services to actually be able to function. It uses a single bulb bearing, but it's ferromagnetic. And I'll show more of how a bulb bearing mechanism works. There's basically two different ways. Uh, well, it's way more than that, but uh, two main ones you see a lot of padlocks working. The spring loaded locking dogs, which is like the tongue and groove system you probably see on a lot of master locks, where the little spring pushes this tongue into a little groove on the shackle to keep it from pulling out. And I'll cover that more in a second. But its actuator, which I'll talk about more, is ferromagnetic, which means a magnet can manipulate it. Uh, you can also open this one via a series of shackle presses. Uh, the alternative for the quick lock is you use an RFID card. This one, if you don't have a, a phone with the right stuff on it to be able to open it, you can actually press the shackle a certain number of times to open it. There's also a fob option as well. And the note so far... It's probably at least the slickest opening, slickest looking. You can actually open up this one, take it apart, get to the internals. Uh, I mentioned there's a certain series of um, clicks you can use to open it. It's like long and short. Like that's a long one, that's a short one, and there's certain combinations like Morse code you can enter that will also open the lock if you don't happen to have a fob with you or you don't have the phone application. And I'm gonna open up the note. And I had to push down once, and now I can unlock, and I can open this on up. Well, I say that. By the way, a lot of the software on these is a little screwy. I've had times when I've had to turn off Bluetooth, restart Bluetooth to actually get things to work, which looks like maybe what I have to do. Yep, let's try that. The software is kind of crappy for that, and I'm thinking that's going to be the next major avenue of attack I need to research. I think it's going to be more likely to actually get me someplace. So, open this app back up. Press it once. Connecting. <sighs> Was that, oh, uh, yes. Uh, a little bit better? Yeah, unfortunately, with the lighting I got here. And now the thing is not even functioning at all. Ask me later on. It does work. The quick lock, uh, sorry, the note does seem to have some software issues with being able to reliably work. Let me try one more time, just opening the app back up. Yeah, 
Well, yeah. It will. That is incredibly annoying. Yeah, unfortunately, these people all have a lot they can do with the software, I'm thinking. But another thing you can do with Note is you can share with other users. Also, there should be a history app inside here that says when it was unlocked and so forth. Also, in some of these, you'll actually have a geographical location of um, where it was unlocked and um, so forth. So as far as tracking, it's an interesting little concept. But as you can see, as of right now, everything is screwed. I may have to reboot my phone to actually get it to work. Now it says connecting. All right. Unlock. Hmm. That does not bode well. Anyway, if it actually worked, the, ex uh, the uh, little actuator inside it would move aside, and I'd be able to move the one ball bearing and open it up. But as you see, that's not functioning well. By the way, this thing runs out of power. You can put a little coin cell after you unscrew this, put a coin cell to it, and be able to hopefully get it open again. But right now, it's acting up. It was the one I was recommending the most until, well, until my fail demo on it completely failed with the actual application and all the keys. But that's the Noke. There's also Master Lock. They have an indoor and outdoor version of their Bluetooth padlock. I bought the um, heavier duty outdoor version, the 4401DLH. Uh, it tracks also when you unlock it and by who. And it can also open with a directional combo. Like, have you seen some of those um, locks where it's like slide, 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 up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, you know, like the Konami code or whatever you want to set? I'm sure a ton of people have set that to Konami code. Um, look it up. Uh, <laughs> um, infinite lives in, um, in uh, Contra, so uh, I imagine a lot of people probably set them to that. But it doesn't use ball bearings, it uses roller bars, and it's a pretty nifty little lock. Let me pull it out. As you can see, it's right here. Uh, once you have it unlocked, and I made a big mistake, I tried to open this screw without unlocking it first, and ended up cutting my hand on the device I was trying to open it up with. You can flip that open and put batteries to it, uh, you can also use a 9 volt if the batteries inside happen to die. And there's a certain series of presses, left, right, left, right, left, right, you can use to open it. And it also gives you messages about, oh, someone failed to actually open it. The shackle seems fairly heavy. Biggest physical problem I found with this one is you might be able to open this thing up by pulling off the rubber cage. Actually, let me do that without having the lock there. I have to unlock it before I think I can. Yeah, let's take that off. There's certain rivets on this that have actually gone in and drilled out. So I'm thinking it might be possible to do that without destroying the rubber housing and be able to get to the internals of it. But let's first go ahead and unlock it. We'll bring up its phone application. Now let me see if I turn this down even lower. Okay, so got to activate it, and it's in what's called um, non-locker mode, to where hopefully when it sees it, it's just going to open up. And now it's not even powering on. Does anybody happen to have a nine? There we go. Locked. I want you to unlock. Now it's unlocked. You can go in and set up a ton of things about it. Let me see. Manage the lock. And, uh, oh great, I'd have to go look this up. But you can go in and see who's unlocked it, who's locked it, so on and so forth. Maybe get some geolocation information from there. And uh, you know, assign rights to be able to open it for other people.
And this finally brings me to the G-Touch. I have some other ones on order. The G-Touch is a little TSA travel lock. The big problem with the G-Touch is it fell apart on my hands when I first got it. I've yet to actually get the accessory work. Uh, I'm not sure if the software is crap or if the software on board it. But regardless, it has a TSA lock in it. And because it has the little TSA key system in that, I don't know if anybody saw this, but um, the TSA keys, someone printed uh, pictures of them, high res, and put them out there on the internet. Also, you can always take apart an old lock and figure it out for yourself. You know, if you took apart another TSA 007 lock, you could um, take measurements and then reproduce the key just from that. Or where I did it was I took out one of the um, cores that was a wafer lock and then put in a blank that was close enough and then kept filing down until I got everything to just the right height and then I reproduced them on um, a key machine. The biggest problem with the 007 lock is that it's very small and I haven't found a proper blank. I have to modify other blanks to actually get the work. So when I first got this thing, it fell apart in my hand. I mean, this all came apart. I mean, it's really nothing I can particularly recommend. And so I have not done much research on it and I'm not going to do much research on it because it's just how do this work? I can't get it to work properly and I, I just can't get it to function at all pretty much. It's not not particularly useful little padlock. There's one called Airbolt that's coming out that I have on order and I'm hoping it's going to be a better travel lock. Though keep in mind all these travel locks, the TSA has a tendency to cut things off or throw them away uh, even if it is the lock they should be able to in theory get into. Um, I've had a few TSA locks um, come up missing over time. This is the Airbolt. Uh, I'm not sure what the keyway is yet. When it comes to TSA keys, there is, um, I guess you could technically say, eight different keys. There's the ones from Safe Skies, um, and then there's the competitor, Travel Century, who doesn't make their own locks at all. They just license out the keyways to other people. And essentially, they have um, seven of their own keyways, uh, 001 through 007. 007 being the far most common one you'll see, and also pretty easy, easy to rake open. That would be one of the big problems with any of these travel locks, is if it has a keyway, generally that's going to be the easiest way into it. Uh, this thing's going to have a proximity alarm, so supposedly if someone starts moving it away, it's going to start screaming. So, you know, if you have to go to the bathroom, you have to leave your baggage just outside, you'll hopefully know about it. Uh, it's crowdsourced geolocation, so you can figure out, great, did my baggage ever leave the airport? I'm not sure how well this is going to work because it's the only way I can think this is working is if enough people have an airboat locked themselves that their phone can report back to the cloud and let you know where your particular lock is. I'm not sure how that's going to work. Also, apparently you could go and say revoke TSA key access, which is probably a good thing since a lot of us carry around those little TSA keys now. Um, but I don't have one yet. So let's talk about physical flaws. We'll skip the electronic part for the time being. I was mentioning that there are different... Um, types of uh, locks out there. Well, you have your locking prowls, also called um, uh, locking dogs, where you have a little spring-loaded piece that fits into a groove on the shackle. And as long as that's in there, you can't actually open it. What happens when you, you turn the core inside of it, it'll pull aside that little locking dog and you'll be able to open the lock. And I'm going to go grab my bag here to see if I actually have one inside of here that's a better demo model. It's not feeling like I do. So, no, nah, I don't seem to have that one with me. But there's a distinctive problem with doing things. It shouldn't have gone forward. There's a distinctive problem with those, which I'll show here in just a bit. Since they're spring loaded, if you can get a thin piece of plastic or metal in there, you can push them aside. Now, here's the way a normal lock works. I just have this up here. Most of these locks don't have keyways, so it's kind of semi irrelevant. Most work by having several stacks of pins. We have a spring, a driver pin, which is the one in blue, and a red pin, which is a key pin. And the idea behind most uh, keys is you when you put a proper key with the proper bidding in, it'll lift all these up to the right level and you'll be able to open the lock. The inner parts are usually called the plug, the stacks are usually called chambers, and all we've covered springs, driver pins, and key pins. This is a wafer lock. A lot of your TSA locks are going to have this. It's just a cheaper way to manufacture locks in general. People usually say wafer locks are terrible. They don't have to be. People can manufacture a decent wafer lock, they just usually don't. And essentially what you have is 
a bunch of wafers to go into a channel and the proper key is put inserted, they're lifted out of the channels and you're able to turn the, the key mechanism. Here's the pin and tumbler and here is you see the key getting inserted and lifting all the pins to the proper level. Uh, here's the wafer lock. You see a key going into it and you see all these little wafers at the bottom being pulled up and out of the way and out of these grooves so you can actually turn it. Here's a little bit more of the pin tumbler lock in operation. The idea behind lock picking is since those uh, chambers aren't drilled perfectly, you can apply a light bit of tension and lift each individual pin. And if you're doing it by touch, one by one, you can feel where one binds. And the idea is you get each one of these to lock up on the ledge, each one of these driver pins. And then if you do it properly, you can pick open the lock. I usually do what's called raking, which is like pseudo randomly going in and out of the lock with certain raking tools and you're essentially it's like fuzzing in software you're simulating a bunch of potential key cuts to be able to hopefully get the lock open now there's also mushroom pins and serrated pins and so forth but we're not going to cover them a whole lot because well most of these locks aren't going to have any kind of uh, actual keyway you can use other than some of the TSA ones that are coming out. But it's basically where you can modify the pin some to make it harder for you to get them above that shear line. They'll kind of stick in there when you try to pick or you think you get a set and you have a false set. Now for tax we can actually use on some of these, there's a technique called shimming. Shimming is essentially that little tongue and groove I mentioned before. You can push that out of the way on some of these locks. So let me demonstrate that. This is a $60 pad lock. It has uh, NFC and um, Bluetooth access capabilities. These are little thin pieces of plastic that I have cut up from something called Neomeat. At least that's what they sell it as off of various uh, Chinese sites. I've seen um, Sparrow sell something called Super Shims that are similar. This thing has two spring-loaded locking dogs on each side. So what you can do is you can go on one side Going on the other side, called butterfly shims also. And there's that $60 uh, high-tech lock defeated with simple physical techniques. So I can't really recommend it. Though its software stack seems to be working better than Note. I was normally recommend the Note to a lot of people until, well, I'm having demo fail even getting it to open properly now. I probably have to reboot my phone. The software stack needs some improvement. Um, you can make these out of uh, all sorts of materials. A lot of people end up using aluminum cans for them. Good way to cut your fingers up. I carry around those little plastic ones because I'm not likely to cut myself on them. And they're good enough for that particular lock. There's also commercial shims you can buy. Alright, magnets. I've heard some people had success with magnets opening these up. Uh, Legion 303 apparently broke his note but got it open with a magnet. I mentioned that um, well, the spring load locking dogs, there's also something called an actuator, which in a ball bearing system, it gets out of the way so the ball bearing can move and you can actually open up the lock. And I'm going to pull out an actual demo to give you a better idea of how uh, a ball bearing system with an actuator works. So here I actually have a little tag out lock. It has a plastic outside, but the internals of this little tag out lock from Master Lock is actually very, very good. This is a hard lock to pick because it's got like five pins and uh, mostly, I think, all spool pins in most of the chambers, but one. And so you can't easily open it. So if I try to zoom in here, you see these little ball bearings? This is the actuator in the center. Those ball bearings have no place to move. I can't shim those. They won't move anywhere. There's no place for them to go. It's not like they're, they're pushed in place by springs. They just can't go anywhere because of the actuator. However, if that core got turned, they would have room to move out of the way and you could pull out the shackle. So the idea behind what Legion's pulling off is somehow manipulating that inner actuator and um, getting it to turn. And since it's made out of ferrous metal, means it's attracted to a magnet, so in theory a good powerful magnet could be able to do something with it. Uh, so far I've had zero luck with that. There's a guy online that goes by the name uh, Bosnian Bill. He also tried to do it. Yes? I'm not sure I'm familiar with the term dead hasp. It's not spring loaded, no. But this little 
ferromagnetic core. Apparently, for some people, they've successfully gotten it to work with a magnet. I've tried it. I've never been able to actually successfully get it to open with one. Uh, Bosnian Bill tried that. Bosnian Bill also tried various uh, destructive techniques. He also did things like um, he took uh, a degausser to it. And if you've ever used a degausser, I mean, the magnetic fields go back and forth, and you end up causing a lot of heat in the vice, and it'll fry the electronics in it. He fried the electronics, but I mean, it's failed closed in this case, so he basically had a lock he had to cut off. <coughs> he was unable to get the thing that I opened up via a magnet. I'm just wanting to try a little bit more. At least he only had the one lock, so I, I don't think he's bought a second lock to destroy just to see if he could do it again. Yeah, but that's just going to make the lock dead. Okay, then I can just use boat cutters. Non-destructive entry is the point here. The idea is to be able to open it and have no one know that I was there. Yeah, I, I'm, I was hoping for it because there's some, so, have you seen some of those governmental locks that's like you push buttons to open up? There's a technique to get past some of those where you put a large magnet on one side and be able to open them up. I was hoping to be able to do something similar to that with the note, but so far, no luck. Well, but then again, I can't get the note to open up today with the actual proper application. Um, now, we'll move on to roller bars. Uh, this one lock works a little bit different principle, and I don't know if I can actually open this thing up without having it fall apart on me. All right, I took the front cover plate off. Now let's see if I can lift anything else out of here. Dissect this thing in not necessarily the greatest lighting conditions in the world. Okay, depending on what position this is in, which is moved by a motor, these little bars can move in and out. So if something's holding this up, this little triangular piece, those bars can't go any place. If something pushes that down, pulls that down, then the roller bars have enough room to move and you can pull it out. So functionally, it should be as good as a ball bearing system at least. And uh, it's using one on each side. Now there's a tack technique I've heard of on the ball bearing ones where you can non-destructively open it, or mostly non-destructively open it, where you take a hammer to it, smack it, and there's enough give inside the locking systems so where the ball bearing will get temporarily pushed out of the way and the shackle will pop open. Um, I have some of my doubts about how non-destructive it is, but I've been told of people doing that kind of thing before. But this is using a simple little ball bearing system which hopefully I can get this thing reassembled. Yeah, this one you, you have to take apart destructively by pulling out those rivets. On uh, the Noke you can actually disassemble with screwdrivers once you actually have it unlocked. Let me see. Will close up for me? Oh. Maybe I should pull that out there. I know this makes for captivating viewing. All right, there should be a way of reassembling this thing eventually. Do I have that the wrong way around? Hope not. That was in the way. All right. And I'll have to test the functionality later on to make sure it actually does lock and open up again. But that's enough of that for the time being. Now, for electronic flaws and software flaws, I have not found a whole lot yet, and I need to start working more on this. It's just a matter of when I have time and I'm not busy with work. Um, I have all sorts of ideas of how to go, apart, go take these things apart. One would be to mess around with the APK that um, are used for the various apps for opening these and see if there's a way I can in reverse engineer those. I mean, you can generally decompile those into Java and see what's going on. If they don't have any kind of brute force techniques, like in the case of, let's say, the quick lock, it might be possible to run through all the possible um, digits that a, one might be keyed to and be able to open it. 
But um, here's all the different APKs that I eventually need to download and look at. Um, I probably won't do too much with the quick lock though since I have a simple physical way in. There's also um, Java decompilers out there so you can actually decompile the APKs directly. And I need to look into uh, Bluetooth low energy and I have now um, an Ubertooth for sniffing that. And actually I feel several years ago we had to create the Ubertooth here to uh, actually uh, give some talks about uh, doing this kind of electronic design. But uh, Bluetooth core specification version 4 has Bluetooth low energy included in it. And the basic idea behind Bluetooth low energy is it's much simplified and you can run it off of coin cells. You don't need like a lithium ion battery or anything for functionality. And Great Scott Gadget sells the Ubertooth 1. For what I've sniffed of the connections, it's not always necessarily the same. I'd see things like um, the name of the device and so forth in the clear, but nothing that looks like I could necessarily replay to be able to do it. Here's the way a challenge response system in theory should be working on these locks. Is um, you want to open up the Bluetooth lock so your phone opens communications with it, negotiates with it. It sends back a challenge. You're supposed to do a mathematical operation on that that only you two have a shared secret to do. And then once you actually uh, do that calculation, send it back. If you send back the appropriate response for that particular nonce, that particular challenge, the lock will hopefully open. Now, I showed you that two of the locks, the master lock and the NOC, have a functionality um, called locker mode on the master lock. I'm not sure if there's a, another name for it. On, oh, sorry, the, the quick lock and the, um, the master lock. Where if you're just nearby it and someone tries to open it and your phone app is up, it is open for you. The downside to that is um, if someone put in a repeater system. And I'm looking around to see if there's a way of doing a Bluetooth repeater. A lot of this talk is going to be me asking the community, hey, uh, if you have any more information on this, let me know. If you have ideas on how to do this to lock, let me know. But I've been told of people who have been getting into car systems using a repeater. Uh, a lot of your car, modern cars are going to have immobilizers in the key, the, the, uh, the key for the car. So the key will not be able to start the engine unless the car can also see like a little off ID essentially inside of your key. But it's not no one's going to be able to. Apparently, some people had some success with um, a repeater system where, let's say, your car is nearby in your driveway, you're in the house, your key is still too far away for the immobilizer to work. They use a repeater system that takes whatever challenge the car sends, sends it to your key by amplifying it, it gets back a response, and it sends that to your car, and you open up the car. And there's a paper out there on someone doing something like this for cars. And I'm wondering if the same thing can be done for these locks. Also, I need to mess around with uh, proxies for apps because I want to see what all information it's sending to the cloud, so to speak, when it unlocks and locks a lock. Because it is keeping track of when the lock's been locked and when it's been unlocked, and I'm pretty sure it's not storing that information on the lock directly. And there may be a way of manipulating this information to be able to open up the lock. Anyway, that's about all I have for this right now. The project is still pretty fledgling because uh, I've done a lot of research on the physical side of these locks, but it's a lot more on the electronic side I'd like to do. So if people have suggestions, let me know. If you want to know more about locks in general, there's the Lock Wiki, which has tons of details and all sorts of uh, brands and models of locks. Uh, Bloomington Fools, Skylar Town Site, Lock Picking 101 is a great forum if you want to learn about locks picking. And uh, there's also uh, Reddit Lock Picking. Tool US, check them out. They're a big lock sport organization in the US. They also have, have a great list of um, lock picking related laws across the country. And if you want to see other tutorials on lock picking, uh, do a Google search for Iron Geek, site colon irongeek.com to limit just my site and then lock picking. And a little announcement about DerbyCon, but since DerbyCon sold out, I'll go ahead and mention a bunch of other good cons to check out. Louisville InfoSec, obviously in Louisville, Kentucky. SkyDogCon, which I think is going to happen sometime in October or November of this year. That's going to be down in Nashville. Uh, GurCon's up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is a fun one to go to. Circle City Con's already been passed for this year, but check out next year's. Um, it's in Indianapolis. The Show Me Con down in St. Louis, which unfortunately is going back to back with Circle City Con, and I'm going to both of them. So I'm going to be very tired that week. And then NOLA Con down in New Orleans, which, I mean, if you don't join the con, you're in New Orleans. I mean, always a good time. Finally, is there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, by whatever name I imagine you, you send it to them as. When you go ahead and say, all right, this lock, please email this particular person 
keys so they can open it, I imagine it would identify them as whatever information you input when you sent them the uh, invite to be able to open your lock. No, it wouldn't be by IP. It'd be by uh, the name of whoever you sent it to. Yes, sir. Um, I don't see any way of, like you could get the password. Uh, is there an alternative uh, admin to be able to? No, and most of these probably not. Master Lock, you might be able to directly contact them and get your password reset via email. But on uh, the other ones, um, I'm thinking probably not. Uh, nope. You can set up, I've set up an account with Noke also. They might be able to recover it for you. That's why I, I keep it in a key, a key store. Great question. I don't have two of the same lock. So um, I imagine it's going to see the, uh, the particular Bluetooth ID. And you saw how some of these, at least the Master Lock app and the, um, the Noak app had, the, had like lock one. It had the option that looked like it stacked for mobile locks. So I imagine it's going to say, okay, which one do I see in my presence? And it's going to do that by uh, the Bluetooth ID, which is essentially, I'm trying to think the name for Bluetooth. Essentially, it's like a MAC address. And it's supposed to be universally unique across these Bluetooth locks. So when it sees a particular one there, it'll go, oh, that one's in my presence. That's the one I'm going to open. Well, people aren't going to have the keys on their phone to be able to open someone else's. And as far as the mobile ones that you have both keys for, it's probably going to say, all right, this guy owns two different locks, but I can tell which one I'm supposed to use it with based on its Bluetooth ID. Or what is it, HCI? There's a term for it. It's basically a MAC address, but Bluetooth. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess... Well, to find robust, how robust do you actually want to get? Ultimately, you can, you can angle grind anything off. The, um, the quick lock definitely doesn't look very robust. I can show you the e, the e touch since it fell apart on my hands. Definitely not robust. The master lock one and the note, eh, fairly tough. And I've, I've seen, I don't know what kind of metal they're making them out of, but uh, I know bon Bosnian Bill, when he opened up the note, he ended up having to take like an angle grinder to it of decent power to be able to cut through the shackle. But ultimately, if you... And he couldn't get it through with like short bolt cutters, but he, if he wanted to use six foot bolt cutters, he figured he could get through it. Yes? Uh, speaking of the robustness, like what happens, what would happen, do you think, if uh, like you drop it on cement? Do you think that would uh, affect the electronics? <sighs> Hard to say. I haven't put him through that much destructive testing. Everything seems to be fairly well put in there, not like it's jingling around a whole lot, other than that E touch. Um, I'd say they'd probably last pretty decently. Yes? As far as I can tell, it's a power only, and there's only one of them that has it. As far as I know, it's power only, but I haven't actually tested that. And there's also, like I said, only one of them that even has that. If they have, they haven't showed it to me. And I imagine maybe, but they're probably doing that after they upgrade the application on your phone. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, actually, I'll have the whole video presentation out there on my website. But if you want the slides, email me, and I can make a Dropbox link or something. But I'll have the video with the slides in it before long up on their website. Yes. That's what I want to do. I'm trying to actually be, get everything in place to be able to do the replays. For what I've done of sniffing, it doesn't look like it's something that's, it looks like it's a challenge response system where you're not necessarily always going to have the same challenge. And if they have enough of a key space for the challenge, you're not going to easily be able to do that. But I suppose if you have repeats, you might be able to do. But uh, it's, I need to do more research. But I'm thinking if they implement it properly, not so much. I'm not thinking it's going to be very, um, it's probably not going to happen, but um, it's still something I need to do more research on. Uh, any issues with loss of power or keys or anything like 
No, apparently they do not reset. Apparently they use a little bit of um, permanent flash memory inside of them because they can depower completely and you still have the key on the lock. And they all have little ways of getting into them so you can repower them if for some reason it does get completely depowered. Like the mass lock, you put a 9 volt to the bottom of it. The note, there's a little coin cell pouch you can stick it to and be able to open it up. And the, the uh, quick lock, you just plug in USB and then let it power up that way. Anybody else? Well, in that case, I thank you for your time.